All right, let's go ahead and get started with a, another lecture on uh, some applications of derivatives. <clears throat> and this time we'll be talking about related rates. Um, so what, the first thing I'll mention is that related rates is, is going to use implicit differentiation uh, quite a bit. So, so make, sure, make sure that you're caught up on that. Uh, make sure that, that implicit differentiation is something that you feel comfortable with. Um, and obviously with implicit differentiation, that's mostly just notation uh, there. So make sure you're comfortable with that uh, before jumping into this. And let's go ahead and get started. So probably the weirdest thing about related rates um, is that we're gonna have we're gonna have variables x and y, but in these problems, they are both gonna be functions of time. So so we're we're gonna instead of having y equals like f of x instead of having that we're, we're not going to do that we're going to say x equals a function of time and y equals a function of time <clears throat> we you could also write instead you could write like x of t and y of t so what that means um, is that when we take a derivative of x or y, we're taking a derivative with respect to time. And so what we're gonna what we're gonna see here is that um, this point kind of lends us to recalling this notation of you know d dy dt or dy we, we've written before. I'll write this first. We've written dy dx, and that's indicated that we're taking a derivative of y with respect to the variable x. So basically y is my function and then x is my variable that I do my power rule or, or whatever, you know, product rule, chain rule, all that stuff. You do that on x and y is just your function that's a function of x. But here now we have dy dt, we also have dx dt. And so we're, we're indicating here that we're taking a derivative with respect to time. And so we've seen with derivatives, those, those talk about change, right? Those talk about how, how one, one variable changes with respect to another. And so here really what we're saying is we've got these variables X and Y, whatever they are, you know, maybe X is height and Y is weight or whatever, whatever they represent. Those are going to change over time and we can see how they change over time by, by taking a derivative with respect to that variable t for time. Um, so be, be very careful there. Um, the problems that we'll see, they'll start off by saying, hey, suppose that x and y are both functions of time t. And that's a big indicator that when you take a derivative, you gotta be careful um, that you're taking a derivative, not with respect to x, but with respect to t. So you don't, whenever you see an x, you don't wanna treat it as just an independent variable. You wanna treat it as an actual function. Um, yeah, and then this is probably pretty clear based on everything I just said, but the variables x and y are not necessarily functions of each other. They in theory could be, but they don't have to be. This isn't really too important of a point, more so just recognizing that x and y are gonna be functions of time and the problems that we're gonna see here. So um, let's go on to an example here. And what I'm gonna mention here is that this example is not a sort of real world application. Um, this is a very mathematical example. This is a very sort of boring, um, you know, it's, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's exactly that. It's a pretty boring example. There's not really anything going on here in terms of like real world scenarios. We'll contrast this with an example later where we'll see, hey, what if I drop a rock into a lake and look at the ripples that, that, uh, that spread over the, over the surface of the water? So we'll look at an application-based example there. But for now, we're just going to stick uh, just completely application free. We're just going to have math here. So we'll notice this first line, suppose that X and Y are both functions of time T. And then I'm giving us an equation that relates X and Y together. And as we've seen before with implicit differentiation, we can take a derivative of this without solving it for Y. And that's, that's helpful in a lot of scenarios, this being one of them. When I see a Y squared and a Y here, and I've got x's and I've got all this stuff here. This just doesn't look like an equation that I really want to solve for y um, because it's just going to be hard. It's just going to take a lot of time. Um, we're more prone to error if we do that. But here's really the big reason. Solving this for y, if, if I took this and I wrote y equals and I had yada, 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 and I had an x and yada, you know, there's all these x's and whatnot in here. 
that really doesn't make that doesn't really help us that much because remember y is not a function of x y is a function of time as is x and so this equation here it relates these variables x and y together but x and y themselves are not functions you know y is not necessarily a function of x it's a function of time and so solving for y here doesn't really even help us at all nor do we really want to because it'll be tough so we're just going to basically the first thing that we're going to do and we'll do this in a second is we're just going to take this and we're going to we're going to take an implicit derivative of it we're going to do our, our steps of implicit differentiation here i note a couple more things um i i eventually want to find the value of dy dt so notice this is this is the the rate of change of y over time, and I give us some other info. I give us that x equals two and y equals three, and that I and then I give us dx dt is equal to thirteen. Um, what you'll see in a second here is that this dx dt, I'm going to label this x prime, and dy dt I'm going to label y prime. And here you have to be very careful because when I put that prime there. We, we've been doing derivatives for a while now, and we're so used to having x be the variable that we take a derivative of. But here, when I write x prime, y prime, that's again, that's indicating this function of time. So I'll keep trying to, to mention that sort of function of time thing. Let's go ahead and get into this. And, and what, we're, what we're doing here really is we're, we're saying, hey, I have values of x and y. I know how x changes over time. I want to find how y changes over time. And so a derivative is my first way to go if I want to try and find how y changes over time. I should do I should do a derivative here. So let's take an implicit derivative um, and let's get a new page here. So we have xy squared plus y. So this is our original equation equals x squared plus 17. And then if I if I go ahead and I actually take a derivative here. Now, on this first term, I'm going to have to do the product rule. And the reason for that is because each of these parts are functions of time. And remember, I am taking a derivative with respect to time, not with respect to x. So we're going to have to be careful when we get here over to this x squared. I'll tell you just as sort of a hint. This is not going to be just 2x. That it, it, does, it doesn't work out that way. It's not that simple. Because we're taking a derivative with respect to time. And each of these portions are both functions of time. So because I have two parts to this term and I'm taking a derivative of it, I have to use the product rule. So. We'll, we'll go ahead and we'll do that product rule. And when I do that, I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna leave the X just as it is. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the derivative of Y squared, which as we've seen with implicit differentiation, it's two Y. But remember that Y is a function of time. And so it's really, instead of this Y right here in this box, you could just think of it as a whole bunch of jumbled stuff with t with time with you know with a t variable in it and so i have to do the chain rule which states that i have to multiply by the derivative of the inner function which i'm just going to label y prime just to be just to be nice and succinct with that labeling we're not done with the product rule we still have to take a derivative of x and then we're going to eventually leave the the y squared there we're just not going to touch that so when i take a derivative of x x is a function of time. So when I take a derivative of it, I have x prime. And, and let me be clear, what I could write here, I could write, hey, x prime of t. I'm just not bothering to write that of t part just to save, you know, just to make it look a little cleaner, just to save some time, you know, for, you know, I don't want to have to write out, you know, of t every single time. So, so we'll, we'll have x prime and that's going to be x prime multiplied by y squared. We'll put some parentheses around all these just to be very clear to ourselves what's going on here. Now we'll, we'll continue on. I'm going to now take a derivative of this plus y. And since I'm taking a derivative with respect to time and y is a function of time, I have y prime. And again, I could put of t, but we're not going to bother. So I have y prime right there. And then I got my equal sign. And now this x squared. I'm going to take a derivative as we normally would. Power rule, 2x right there. 
But because x is a function of time, there is an inner function in there. And so I have to do the chain rule, which says to multiply by an x prime. Then plus 17, well, when I take a derivative of 17, that just goes away to zero. So here, what we've got is we have now have an equation. We can, we can simplify this. So let's go ahead and do that. 2xy, y prime plus, I'll go ahead and write this y squared x prime plus y prime equals 2x x prime. We have an equation here that relates four variables, x, y, y prime, and x prime. And so we, we can come back to our problem here. We can say, well, what are we looking for here? Well, I'm looking for dy dt. I'm looking for y prime. That's, that's what the question states. So it's a pretty good guess to, hey, let's solve for y prime. So we're going to take this and we're just going to solve it for y prime. And we remember our steps for doing that. We, we take every term that has a y prime and we bring it to one side of the equation. And we bring every term that does not have a y prime and we bring it to the other side of the equation. So all I've done here on this step is I've taken that term and I've moved it over to the other side here uh, by subtracting it, as you can see. Now I have all my y prime terms on one side and I have everything else on the other side. So now I can factor out my y prime. And then remember, I like, to, I like to put that y prime on the right hand side just so we don't get confused there with our notation. And then while I'm at it here, you don't have to do this, but I'm gonna factor out an x prime. I think that makes it look a little bit nicer. So, and, 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 and that, then we just have our x prime just right there. So that, that's nice and easy. Um, so let's go ahead and, and now we'll just solve for y prime. And we have two x minus y squared multiplied by x prime all over, 2xy plus 1. And so here we have found a formula for y prime in terms of x, y, and x prime. You'll notice the only, the only variables over here are that x, there's a y, and there's an x prime right there. So luckily, we're trying to find y prime, and we have values for x, y, and x prime right there. So let's go ahead and just plug them all in. Um, when we actually go ahead and do that, let's let's move this over. I've got enough space to sort of squeeze this in down here. When we actually do that, I'll put it in green. We're going to say x is equal to 2 minus y is equal to 3. Don't need, don't need to bother with any parentheses there. 3 squared times that x prime. Remember that x prime was 13. We got that right there. So we'll plug that in. Multiplied by 13. All over 2 times x is 2. y is 3 plus 1. And when we actually go ahead and work all this out, you should get negative 5. And so that right there, that's our answer. That, that tells us what the value of y prime is that that tells us that uh, exactly what dy dt is when x is equal to 2 y is equal to 3 and x prime is equal to 13. And so what you'll notice here is that this problem it, it's basically just it's basically just implicit differentiation and especially when I don't put in an application in here it's really just hey do implicit differentiation on this you got to obviously be careful about you know, your x's here and that you're going to have x primes somewhere in there. But then you're just plugging everything in and then you're just solving for y prime and, and you're done. Uh, you know, this, all of this work right here in the blue and the orange, I guess all the work in the orange because the blue is just the problem statement there. All of that work in the orange is just implicit differentiation. Obviously, there's that added caveat of this x prime that, that comes into play that we have to worry about. But that just comes with remembering that, that uh, x and y are both functions of time and x is not just our independent variable. Um, and so you just obviously have to remember that tiny little detail, but it's really just implicit differentiation here. And then we do some plugging in to get an actual number out for our answer. And so that tells us what the rate of change of 
y is. So whatever this equation describes, I mean, who knows what it describes? Maybe it describes your height and weight relative to each other. Um, it could describe anything. It could describe uh, how hungry you are and how much food you're, you're able to eat. Um, it can, maybe they relate how much, how many hours of sleep you get uh, and how far you, or how long you can exercise for the next day. Who knows what they, what they, uh, you know, what they relate, but we know that whenever our variables are two and three and the X variable is changing over time at a rate of 13, we know that Y is decreasing because of that negative, it's decreasing at a rate of five over time. And, and there we go. We've got a, a sort of a value there that we can assign some meaning to. So that's that right there. Um, let's move on to, a, to an example that has an application in it. And what we're gonna see, at least with this one here, is that <clears throat> the tough part is going to be setting up our equation. The actual implicit differentiation will be um, almost too easy, actually. It's easy to get tripped up on it, but it'll be very, very easy for the actual implicit differentiation. But setting up the problem is what's gonna be tough. So um, in this case, I'm obviously not just giving you, you know, an equation that just relates X and Y. We got to come up with, with, these, with these things. Um, and I'll be clear here as well. I'm not going to use the letters X and Y because there are sort of better letters to use. But let's go ahead and get into it. So a small rock is dropped into the middle of a lake. So I just take a rock and I drop it into the lake. And then obviously from that, you're going to have circular ripples that sort of spread out over the surface of the water. And what you could do is you could be standing on the edge of the water and you could you could go look at at how far those ripples are are moving out. Right. And you could look at the radius of those circles. Right. So you could you could go measure, you know, you could have a stopwatch out and you could, you know, um, maybe have markers in the water or something markers every two feet. And you notice that, hey, this this ripple moves two feet every second, which means that the radius of that circle, right, as this circle gets larger and larger and larger, every single second, it, it just increases another two feet right there. And so what you can do is you can actually find the rate of change of the area inside these ripples. So obviously, when we first drop the rock, and then the ripple, you know, the, that first ripple is, is uh, you know, is there. And then it gets a little bit bigger. So now it's a little bit further away. Obviously the area that that ripple sort of um, covers, you know, all of this area here, that increases as, as time moves on and the ripple keeps moving further and further out, that circle is just gonna keep getting larger and larger. And so the area that it contains is gonna be larger and larger and larger. And so what I want us to do is I want us to find the rate of change of that area at the instant that the radius is four feet. So the moment that that radius is equal to four, I wanna know how fast the area is changing. Um, and so let's let's go ahead and, and first, let's come up with an equation that describes these variables. And so the variables that I'm gonna use here is, I'm gonna use A for area. And notice that I'll mention that A is a function of time and then for the radius, that obviously changes over time as well. I'm going to use actually little r. So the question here is, can I relate these variables a and little r, capital A and little r there? Can I relate those to each other? And fortunately, we actually have a way to relate the area of a circle to the radius of the circle. And this should be this should be pretty pretty straightforward. We have a is equal to pi r squared. That tells us that whatever the radius is, if I square it and then multiply that by pi, I get the area of my circle. And so right here we have come up with a way to relate the the values of a and r. So now if I want to find the rate of change of the area what I'm looking for here, this rate of change of the area, that's going to be what I'll call a prime. You, you could write dA dt, but a prime is a little bit more succinct. And then that's, well, really, that, that's what we're looking for here. I also tell us 
Let's go ahead and do this in red here. I tell us that the radius of each circle is increasing at a rate of two feet per second. That tells me that r prime is equal to two. And then obviously with units of feet per second, we'll get into units in a little bit, but r prime is equal to two. And then lastly, we'll do this in purple here. The radius is four feet. Well, that tells us that r is equal to four. So really what I have here is I have r is equal to four and r prime is equal to two, and I'm looking for a prime. This is very, very, very similar to this problem that we did back here. I was looking for y prime and I was given x, y, and x prime. And so I, I'm given all of this info and I just need to find one of the other variables, y prime. And so in this case, we're doing, we're doing the same thing. We obviously have this equation down here, a equals pi r squared, but I'm given the info that r is equal to four, r prime is two, and I'm looking for a prime. So if we actually take this equation right here, and we take an implicit derivative of it, what we'll notice is on this left side, if I take a derivative of a, and remember we're taking a derivative with respect to time, I just get a prime. I get whatever the derivative of a is because I'm taking a derivative with respect to time and a is a function of time. Then with this pi r squared, I do my normal power rule. I drop the two down, I subtract one. That brings that two down there. So I have two pi r, and that r is obviously raised to the one. So I have my two pi r, but chain rule tells us that because this r is a function of time and I'm taking a derivative with respect to time, I have to have a chain rule term that says I multiply by r prime, whatever the derivative of that r is. Now, luckily I'm looking for a prime. I know that r is four and r prime is two. I plug them in and I get 12 pi as my answer. And that's, that's really it. This, this equation almost, like I said, it's almost too easy to take a derivative of. It's, it's very easy for, for students to, to do this. They just say, oh, a prime, it's just it's two pi r, take a derivative. But you got to remember, r is not what we're taking the derivative with respect to. We're taking the derivative with respect to time. And because this variable right here is not time, it's not a T, I have to do chain rule, which says that I have to multiply by that R prime, which is whatever the derivative of R is with respect to time. So we got can't forget that chain rule part. Um, and we get our answer of 12 pi. What you'll notice here is that I have units and I've kind of just thrown them in out of the blue in feet squared per second. I'll explain two different ways for you to do for, for you to figure out what the units are of this. And obviously, we care about units, right? You know, we're, we're watching these circular ripples, you know, um, expand in this pond. We, and we want to know, hey, how fast is the area changing? I mean, it matters if we're talking about feet or meters or miles or seconds or hours or minutes. I mean, it matters what those units are. So the first way that you could do these units, and this is not how I've done it, but it's perfectly viable, is you can keep your units in here. So instead of writing, let's go ahead and do this in, in purple. I'll kind of do this off to the side. You could have your work look like this. Two pi. R is four, but it's in four feet. I'll go, I'll go ahead and put that in red. I'll put those units in red just to highlight them. R prime, let's let's go back here. R prime was two, remember? And you'll notice that I say two feet per second. So that feet per second right there is huge. That tells me that R prime is, it has a value of two, but then the units are feet per second. So now if I just do my multiplication here, I end up still with that two times pi times four times two is my 12 pi. But then my units are feet times feet, which are feet squared divided by second. And that's how I got my units that way. There's a second way that you can think of that you can figure out your units, and this is how I tend to do it. Um, I I think about I, I sort of think about it intuitively. I I personally am not a fan of just carrying out. I don't like having to write feet feet per second over and over and over and over. It just seems like a lot of extra writing to me that I don't really feel like doing. So what I what I recognize here is that this a prime gonna move this work just a little bit. This a prime right here, 
I could write that as DA DT. And what I know just from just from you know understanding shapes and things like that, I understand that area is is going to be in terms of like square feet, right? If you talk about the area of a room, you talk about, hey, how much, you know, how much space is in this room? Uh, 300 square feet, you know, 300 feet squared. Area is always going to have units of feet squared. Right. Or, and it doesn't, like I said before, it doesn't necessarily have to be feet. It could be meters squared. It could be centimeters squared, but it's always going to be some length that's being squared. Obviously, in this problem, we're dealing with feet. Feet have been listed in the problem statement. So I know that the units of this area have to be feet squared. And then I'm dividing that by time. And well, time is in seconds. Obviously, here I told us that the, that the, radius was increasing at a rate of two feet per second. So we're not dealing with hours. We're not dealing with minutes. We're dealing with seconds here. And so right there, just sort of matching this up, I just end up seeing what those units have to be. And I put them in. If I had something like um, DLDT, maybe where L stands for a length, um, then I would have feet per second, right? Because L would just be a singular length rather than a than like a square footage or something like that. So that's how I that's how I do my units. I I kind of just match them up with this, you know, form formula or this format for a prime. You you're welcome to keep your units here and carry them through all of your work and end up with your final answer there. Either way, you should get the same units. Uh, it doesn't matter to me what you do. Um, and that's so that's going to be it for our examples on related rates. Let's finish up with just sort of a a list of steps on what to do. So. On all, on pretty much all of these related rates problems that we're gonna we're gonna do, we're gonna see that they're gonna be application based. That's really where we get into the nitty gritty of related rates. So the very first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna write an equation that describes this situation, which for us was this a equals pi r squared. We we read through this problem statement and we recognize that we're looking at comparing radius and area. And so I got to relate radius and area. So that's that's this first step. Write an equation that describes the situation. And I'll kind of I'll kind of put this in. Hey, you know, on this last problem, we had a equals pi r squared. Identify variables that you have and variables that you want. Well, in in this last problem, the variables that we had, we were given r is equal to four feet, and we were given r prime is equal to two feet per second. And then the variables that we wanted, we were looking for a prime. We didn't know what that was. And so right there, I've identified, hey, these are the variables I have. These are the variables I want. Boom. Then we implicitly derive the equation. Let's go ahead and squeeze that in here. A prime was equal to 2 pi r r prime. So, so we did that work already. We solve for the desired variable. In the case of this problem, we, we didn't even have to do anything there. It was already solved for a prime, which is the variable that we wanted, right? We've got this list. We say, hey, a prime is what we want. And in this case, we don't have to do that because it was already solved for a prime. Uh, let's make that look that NA look a little bit better. So then the next thing that we do is we substitute in our known values and our known values are here. So we substitute those into the equation that we have already implicitly derived. And we end up with a equals two pi times four times two, which is that 12 pi. And then we have our units of feet squared per second. And then just don't forget units, just always double triple check that you've put units there. I will um, definitely uh, mark off if you don't have any units there. So, um, yeah, that's basically related rates and sort of in, you know, showing these steps in the context of the example that we just did. Write your equation, identify the variables that you have and the variables you want, implicitly derive the equation, solve for the variable you want, substitute in the variables that you know, units, 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 units. Um, the very last thing that I'll mention here is actually on this second step here. Um, identify the variables that you have and the variables that you want. What I see a lot of students do and, and this is this is definitely good. Uh, they, they make a little table. They say have, want. And in this want, they'll put, you know, hey, a prime. I, I don't know what that is. I, I want that. 
I want to know. That's what we're being asked for. And then in the half, they'll put, hey, R is equal to two. Ooh, I believe it was four feet. R is equal to four feet. R prime is equal to two feet per second. That way they just have this nice, clear, hey, here's a table that, that they can look at and they can say, all right, I know what I have, I know what I want. And then when they go to actually implicitly derive their equation, they can just look at what they have and they can plug it in. They can look at what they want and they can solve for that variable appropriately. So that's related rates. Um, we'll go ahead and call that the lecture.